Okay, here's the next video then, folks. So 2018, uh, high level time zone one, paper one. Which metal is the strongest metallic bond in sodium, magnesium, aluminium, calcium? Well, of course, if we kind of simplify this down in there, you think, right, that's going to be Na plus, which is basically going to be 2, 8 uh, plus. It's simplifying this like it's GCSE. That's going to be Mg2 plus, which is going to be 2, 8 also, but 2 plus. And this is going to be Al3 plus, which is going to be 2, 8 as well but now three plus and then calcium of course that would be calcium two plus because it's in group two uh, so that would be two eight eight two plus so i don't know about versus sodium but um certainly it's going to have weaker metallic bond in the magnesium because they're both two plus uh, but it's a larger ion so there'll be a greater distance between the uh, positive nucleus and the c of delocalized electrons so our strongest metallic bonding is actually going to be aluminium because these three are all isoelectronic they're all uh, sort of two in the first shell eight in the second shell but this has got a bigger positive charge it'll have three times the amount of delocalized electrons because of course each atom has lost three electrons and it's going to have the smallest ionic radius as well because it's got the biggest nuclear charge so aluminium three plus will have the strongest metallic bonding Again, if you remember, so like that's the trend as you go across period uh, three. Anyway, you get sodium up to magnesium, up to aluminium, jumps up to silicon, and then comes crashing back down for uh, phosphorus, up a little bit for sulfur, down for chlorine, and down for argon. Okay, if you're familiar with your melting points. 12, which molecules have at least one sp2 hybridized atom? Uh, so if we kind of draw these out a bit more. So here's ethanoic acid. We've got a double bond. So that's going to be sp2 and sp2. Uh, propanone, again we've got a double bond, so that's going to be sp2, that's going to be sp2. The other two carbons, of course, here are sp3. And then, okay, it looks like propanol, but it's not. Watch out here, because it's not CH3, CH2. It's actually an alkene with then an alcohol there. So again, we've got a double bond, so this would be sp2 and sp2. So it's actually all three of them. Of course, that'd be sp3 then. So it'll be one, two, and three all together. It's just thing when you see a double bond, you think sp2. Uh, there are exceptions like carbon dioxide, of course. Carbon dioxide where, because this carbon's actually got two double bonds, yes, the oxygens are sp2, but the carbon is actually sp, because of course, having the two double bonds is like having a triple bond. Uh, 13, which can be represented with only one Lewis structure. So we've got methanol, benzene, ozone, nitrate. Well, again, you'll save yourself a lot of time if you know that some of these, right, so benzene, you can draw more than one Lewis structure. You can that one and then swap the double bonds around to have that one ozone you can have the double bond there or you can have it here again they're not complete Lewis structures unless I add the uh, lone pairs of course and again the nitrate there's three possible ones you could draw depending on moving around the double bond and of course in reality what you actually have is resonance hybrids uh, so I could move the double bond to there, the double bond to there. Methanol is only one place for it. It's basically this. So there's nowhere else I can put the double bond. So it's here. Okay. Let's say I could put the double bond there, double bond there. What is the entropy of combustion of butane in kilojoules per mole? Uh, so we've got two butanes, we have to have 13 oxygen to make 8 carbon dioxide and 10 waters. Now that's in bold, that's a bit of a warning. What I think that's going to warn us is that we need to halve this because we're burning two butanes and if it's per mole, which you don't the standard entropy combustion would be just to burn one. So let's take that down to one. That comes down to six and a half. Might be a good idea actually sort of scratching them out on the paper in case you decided to change your mind, but I'm fairly confident on this one. Eight divided by two is four. Ten divided by two is five. So then we don't actually have to construct a hair cycle. We've just got to find the products and the reactants and multiply them up or flip them or whatever. So here has carbon dioxide, carbon and oxygen, well oxygen's there but we're not into that. I'm looking for the carbon dioxide, it's a product and it's a product here, so that's good. So it's going the right way, but I'm only making one, I need to make four. So basically, I'm just going to have to have plus four X. And then, okay, I'm making water here, well that's good because I'm making water on this side. So again, the products are on the same side, so that's good. But I can't just have one water, I need five waters, so I'm going to have to multiply that by five. So it's going to be plus five Y. And then looking at the last equation, well, there's my butane, but it's on the wrong side. It's a product, whereas I need it as a reactant. The good news is there's one of them, and I only want one. So basically, I just need to flip this equation around to make it the reactant. If I flip this equation around, all I need to do is change the sign from plus Z to minus Z. So my entropy change is plus 4X plus 5Y minus Z, so that matches up with A.
in those they were trying to catch you out on this one here that would be if you'd left the equation as it was but then that wouldn't have been the standard enthalpy change we need to burn just one mole of butane Number 15, which statement is correct? In an exothermic reaction, the products have more energy than the reactants. Well, it might help if we sketch uh, an exothermic reaction. So, of course, that looks like that. So, that's exo, whereas endo would be like this. That's up to there. So, in an exothermic reaction, the products have more energy than the reactants. Well, they don't. They're lower in energy than the reactants, so it's not that one. In an exothermic reversible reaction, the activation energy of the forward reaction is greater than that of the reverse reaction. Uh, well, no, it's smaller, so it's only up to there, whereas the reverse reaction is up to there, so it's not that one. In an endothermic reaction, the products are more stable than the reactants. So here is endothermic the products. They're less stable. They're higher in energy than the reactants, so it's not this one. So it must be this one, an endothermic reversible reaction. The activation energy of the forward reaction is greater than that of the reverse reaction. Well, yes, it is. Here's the activation energy for the forward reaction. Of course, the reverse reaction would just be that distance there because it would be exothermic going backwards. So D is the right answer. 16. What is the enthalpy of solution of magnesium fluoride in kilojoules per mole? Then we've got the lattice enthalpy, the hydration enthalpy, and hydration enthalpy of the fluoride. Well, basically, okay, if we're starting here, which is our magnesium fluoride solid, and then we're going to be converting that to uh, magnesium 2 plus aqueous plus uh, 2 fluoride ions, aqueous, once they go for a swim. So that's what I'm trying to find, the enthalpy of solution. And of course, the lattice enthalpy going up there would be uh, to convert these to gaseous ions. So that would be Mg2 plus gas plus 2F minus gas. So, and that's an endothermic process because we're breaking these ionic bonds. So that's our plus 2926. And then, okay, we've got our enthalpies of hydration in turn then. So first of all, we dissolve uh, one of them in water. Let's say the magnesium. That would get us as far as Mg2 plus aqueous plus the two fluorides, which is still a gas. And then, okay, we get down to where we're heading for. So the magnesium, that would be minus 1963. And then the fluorines, well, of course, there's two of them. There's not just one, so that's going to be two times minus 504. So what does that read with? So plus 296, because, yeah, we want to get from there to there, but we can't go that way, so we've got to go up here, down there, down there. So plus 296, so it's not going to be these two. And then coming down there, minus 1963, and then minus or plus 2 times minus 504. So we're looking at this one here. Okay, that would be the correct one because, of course, we need the 2. Which statement is correct? If delta H is less than naught, reaction is always spontaneous. Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, either of these two. I uh, don't agree with those because, of course, you get spontaneous uh, exothermic ones and endothermic ones, which are not always going to be spontaneous. In fact, it's only going to be spontaneous if delta H is less than naught, but then delta S is greater than naught. That's when it could only be uh, always spontaneous. So what about this one here? Well, if we look at the Gibbs equation, delta, H, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So the reaction is spontaneous as long as delta G is negative. Uh, so what about the next two? Because I was saying the point here is, okay, if this is less than naught, that's a good start. But then if delta S is also negative so yeah, if delta s is also negative that could then become positive at higher temperatures even though it's uh, negative oh, i contradict what i said earlier so what about this so if delta s is less than naught so if delta s is negative uh the reaction can be spontaneous if temperature is low enough well yeah because of course it's going to be minus and minus that's going to become a plus and the point of a high t is t always makes delta s more significant so i'm liking that one because if delta s is minus then minus or minus is going to be a plus, and that's going to be amplified by a high temperature. Whereas, can be spontaneous if temperature is high enough. No, it's going to become less spontaneous at high temperature, so we don't want that one there. Okay. So we're going to go with C, because, yeah, if delta S is negative, that's uh, a problem, but as long as T is low, then it's not going to be enough to make it um, positive overall, as long as delta H is still negative as well. Number 18. Which change increases the rate of formation of hydrogen when zinc reacts with excess hydrochloric acid, assuming all other conditions remain the same? Adding water to the acid, well, that's going to decrease its concentration and make it slower. Decreasing the temperature would make it slower. Increasing the volume, well, that won't affect the rate. It won't even affect the amount of gas because it's in excess anyway. 
uh, would only be if we increase the concentration that um, it would be uh, faster. Decreasing the size of the zinc particles, well, yeah, that'll give it a larger surface area, so you get a greater frequency of collision. So we're looking at D. Nineteen. What are correct labels for the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution uh, energy curves? Well, remember that's the one where it kind of goes up and then it comes back down, but never touches the origin again. So what we're looking at is energy on the x-axis, and then we normally say number of particles, but the number of particles isn't here. So and yet kinetic energy is fine. This one they were kind of confusing. We don't want progressive reaction. Progressive reaction would be where they're confusing it with energy profile diagrams, where you'd have progressive reaction. And then you'd have energy. And that would be when you're showing whether something is, let's say, exothermic, for example. So I'm not like in these ones with the progressive reaction. Uh, so yeah, I want energy on the x-axis. X axis, and this probability density will be the sort of same as the number of particles then. So I'm going with D, because I know it's definitely energy on the x-axis. And it shows, remember, the point is that so I get high energy or it's only those particles which have sufficient energy to react. If you increase the temperature, then you change the shape of the curve and you make it broader and flatter, same overall area underneath, but now all these particles would have the en enough energy to react as well. So probability density will go there. Number 20, the reaction between uh, nitrogen dioxide and fluorine gives the following rate data at a certain temperature. What's the overall order of reaction? Well, let's look here. They keep fluorine constant, but they double the concentration of nitrogen dioxide uh, and the rate quadruples. It's four times faster. So it's second order with respect to NA2, NO2, sorry. So second order with respect to NO2. And then, okay, let's compare uh, this reaction and this one. So here they keep the concentration of nitrogen dioxide the same, but they double the concentration of fluorine and the rate is twice as fast. So it's going to be first order with respect to fluorine. So second order plus first order, two plus one, that's going to be three. 